We have Trevor Oldham with us here today. And if you want to follow along, I'm going to direct everybody to Trevor's website. So go to podcast for, oh, I better going to start over again. We have Trevor Oldham with us here this afternoon. And if you want to follow along, head over to Trevor's website. It's podcastingu.com. Trevor, did you have any place else you'd like people to follow along? No, that's that's perfect, Jack. You know, outside our website, that's a, that's excellent. Okay, great. So again, it's podcasting you, and we're going to be talking about podcasting today, as well as the benefits associated with uh, getting on not only other people's shows, but possibly starting one yourself. So really appreciate your time, Trevor. Thank you, Jack. Excited to be here. So I got I to gotta start things off by asking, you kind of uh, found yourself a niche here. Why did you focus on real estate investing when it comes to podcast? Yeah, most certainly an excellent question. I think really the story starts, you know, a long time ago where back in, I believe it was 2015, I started my own podcast. I no longer run it, but I've been running the show for about two years. And that's what, you know, got me into the podcasting game. And through that podcast, my myself that I was running, I interviewed, you know, real estate investors, entrepreneurs, business folks, you know, I think we had about 60 episodes, you know, that I was able to come out with. And I realized I love talking to real estate investors. And long story short, end up starting the company now podcasting you. And I continue to work with a lot of different niches, you know, the company was small, I could take almost any client that I could get, you know, lawyers, politicians, um, health professionals, you know, any aspect, I worked with them. And after about two years of running the company, I realized that I didn't necessarily like all these niches. Some people are some niches were very mean to work with. I don't know exactly why. It's just the way that they were, you know, typically more politicians. I don't know if that's the way the space is, but I've learned that working with real estate investors, I really enjoyed working with them. And I saw that they had the greatest benefit. So really the last three years or so, we've gravitated more towards working with real estate investors than any other niche. It was just, I got along with them. I could understand their impact. And yeah, that's that's really how it started. Sure. Well, let's talk a little bit about the, the, the concept here. You know, you're focusing on real estate investors. Let's, you're, you're bringing on clients and you're helping them with what? Are you helping them with the launch of their own podcast or are you trying to get, are you getting them on as guests? Yeah, so it's a little bit of both. We have some clients that come to us that want to start their show. They just don't have the time to necessarily go out and you know edit the show, put it out, those sort of things. And conversely, we have clients come to us that, they have no interest in starting their podcast. All they want to do is be a guest on other people's podcasts. So it's really a combination of both. And I find both have, you know, both have their pros, both have their cons. Sure. Well, let's go through some of those pros and cons. Let's say somebody is thinking about starting a podcast of their own. What would be some of the benefits that you advise that, you know, when it comes to that? Yeah, I would say, you know, first and foremost is being able to network. You know, I think that's the biggest, you know, definitely the biggest aspect of it too. You could, you get to control the narrative where you have your own show. You get to ask your own questions. And then I think three, and this was back when I was starting, you know, when I had my own podcast is I was just starting off in business and I was able to interview folks that, you know, they were doing 1 million, 10 million, you know, $20 million a year in revenue where I haven't even cracked, you know, $10,000 a year in revenue for my own business. And I was able to get access to them where if I email them and say, Hey, can I have 30 minutes to pick your brain? They would say, you know, get out of here. But if I said, you know, can I have 30 minutes to interview you on my podcast? They were more gracious because of that. And then, mm-hmm. you know, that allowed me to, you know, to infinitely gain my knowledge where I didn't have to pay them anything, just, you know, the 30 minutes of my time. So that was definitely, you know, that's honestly probably one of the biggest pros I had found when starting my own show. Yeah, I, I, I can echo that quite a bit. You know, to be frank, you know, I, I run very few advertisements and then like on here because frankly, the, the value I get is, is just the networking and discuss, talking to my guests. This is, this is pretty selfish endeavor to be frank. Yeah, most certainly I can, I can definitely see that. And I don't think people, you know, people that don't have their podcast don't understand, you know, how much it really is to network. And I know that everyone talks about networking, but how many times do you go to a meetup and someone's just sharing you their business card? You talk to them for, I don't know, 30 minutes, one minute, you know, elevator pitch, and then you move on. We're podcasting. You can talk to that person for, you know, 30 minutes and really build a good connection with them. Right. So what are some of the benefits of just simply being on as guest on the podcast? Yeah, I find that being a guest on other people's podcasts where one, you don't have to do any of the editing. All you really do is get to show up and do the interview. And then two, that host 
has taken time to build their podcast, to build a network of listeners. And you almost like, in essence, get to piggyback off what the host has done. So I find that you're able to benefit from all the work that the host has done, where you get that, where you just get to show up and, and do the interview, which is, which is nice, especially if someone that's very busy. Sure. So let, let's talk about um, being a guest. You know, I'm kind of going backwards here on this on this situation. Let's say you you decide you want to be a guest on a podcast. Is there a way somebody should maybe consider approaching a podcast for for that? Yeah, most certainly. I feel like, you know, first you want to make sure that you, you know, one, you want to make sure you have a product or service. You know, well, it's nice to go on podcast. It is the time that you're valuing. So you want to make sure you have that set up. You want to make sure that you have a website, some sort of set up, you know, more often than not podcast hosts at the end of the show will ask you where to send listeners to or where can they find more. I know, Jack, you had done that earlier in the show, but you want to make sure you have somewhere to send that audience. So, you know, you want to make, get those two things squared away right off the back. And then when it's reaching out to these hosts, you want to make sure that when you're almost in essence pitching yourself to these podcast hosts, you're making sure that it makes sense for you to be a guest on their show. You know, one, does that host have guests? You know, does the show, you know, post frequently or do they post, you know, once every three months where you're going to have a little probability of going on that show. And then if you're someone starting out, that's a little bit newer to the business, but you do have some experience and you would like to go on podcasts, you know, are there podcasts, you know, in real estate, say you have the bigger pockets, you know, that's, the you know, probably the number one podcast, you know, in the space, it's probably going to be the most hardest to reach show to be on, you know, that's not necessarily a show where you would want to go on, you know, you might want to start off on the show's that have only been around for a few months. And then two, you know, it's why do you want to be a guest on that show? What can the, what value can that audience benefit from you being a guest on that show? You know, and then just doing the research from there, you know, putting a pitch together, but again, you know, making sure it's the right fit for your show. We've seen numerous times a client comes to us and they give us a list of shows they want to be on and they're a house flipper and they're trying to go on multifamily investing podcasts, which is two totally different audiences. And conversely, we have the multifamily folks and they give us a podcast and it's geared towards people that are flipping houses, you know, the audiences are going to be entirely different. So you want to make sure that you're targeting the right shows as well. Yeah. One of the things that I want to echo on that is, is, is bringing the value to the show. Sometimes, you know, I have to be honest, sometimes I get people on here and, and I, I want to pr have them present some sort of actionable strategy that people can implement, you know, um, and, and sometimes it feels like it's turning into an infomercial. Mm. for whatever they're trying to sell and and uh it, it's if you've ever read the go-giver it's really out out of scope of of what that is you know we want to bring that's what that's what as a podcast host you really want somebody to bring some value exactly and, and there's always going to be a time and place in this show you know for you to promote yourself but if you just give value to the audience they're gonna be like hey this person's you know they're sharing a lot with me how can i learn more about them and then that's just by you giving your value so i can definitely definitely test that Sure. Well, you, you were also mentioning, you know, uh, starting your podcast, you know, let's, let's talk a little bit about like, let's say somebody decided they want to get into podcasting. Could you kind of give kind of a breakdown of exactly what they're getting themselves into if they decide to do that? Sometimes I think they think it's easier than it is, whether it's preparing for the show or the equipment they probably should consider using or even the hosting provider that they should probably consider? Yeah, I would say definitely, you know, two considerations are one is going to be a time commitment and two, it's, I guess there's three actually, you know, time commitment, you know, learning, you know, not, you know, expanding your knowledge and then also the cost of money, you know, to get everything like you mentioned. And I'll start off with the cost of money. Typically you're going to want to use a hosting platform. A lot of folks, you know, they might use Libsyn, they might use Buzzsprout, you know, you can look online. You know, they're not going to be too expensive and they might run you about 10 to 20 dollars per month depending on the platform you use the reason you want to use a platform instead of posting on your website is your website will just get overloaded if you just post the video files there and it's just not going to be great and two when you use the hosting platform such as say it's a libsyn they can put it out there on google um, i believe google music um, spotify they can put it out there on app on apple so that's definitely why you want to use a hosting platform then you're going to want to have a mic. You know, right now I'm using uh, the Yeti microphone. I believe I bought it, it was about 120. Um, you definitely want a good microphone, so that's going to be a little bit of a cost. And then outside of that, you know, you want to have some professional sort of background or lighting. Like I have a ring camera or ring light camera in front of me. You know, that was about 20. dollars So all in, you know, 
equipment is about 250 you know looking at just for the upfront cost and then when it comes to your time commitment and if you don't have necessarily a lot of money to pay someone to go out and, and edit your show and produce it you know it's going to take a lot of time you know it could take anywhere from five to ten hours per month in the beginning and it's not just producing the show i mean i guess i should say that's just producing the show then when it comes to researching the person that you're going to be interviewing because you don't want to just have no idea about their background and also to taking the interview and creating social media clips out of it to promote the interview you know that's going to be another you know five to ten hours per month so really the podcast thing is going to be about 10 to 20 hours per month in the beginning you know over time you'll become a little bit better you'll figure out how to edit things better you'll figure out you know what quest type of questions you want to ask guests and you might get that down to 10 hours um, per month and then two you know like the experience like anything else it's going to be new to you if especially if you're starting your own podcast and you don't know exactly what to do i know when i was starting my own show and i'm not sure if the resource is still available but i know pat flynn from smart passive income had a tutorial on youtube it was about eight parts or nine parts and he walks you through exactly how to take a podcast interview and edit it and put it out there um so definitely you know that's a consideration too and, and something else i want to mention too if you are wanting to start your own podcast and you are nervous about it because you've you've never interviewed anyone it's going to be okay. I know when I first started my podcast, I ran into some issues where I, you know, butchered the host or butchered the guest's name. I butchered their bio. Overall, went you know pretty bad. But after you know the first ten or so episodes, you're going to start to get a little bit better. And then you know, 25, 30 episodes in, 30 episodes in, it's going to get a little bit easier as well. But there's definitely you know those three considerations between the time, um, the knowledge, and then also the cost of getting everything started. Sure. So when you're developing your own podcast and, and you're bringing on guests, um, do you advise people to find a niche and kind of keep things, like making sure the guest is a, is a proper fit or, or is it good to invite anyone and everyone on and, and just to have that experience? Yeah, I think it definitely depends where you're looking for. I find if you want to build a larger listenership, you definitely want to niche down. And let's say if you're a real estate show, you know, if you want to get really granular, you can go right down to the niche that you're doing, or you know, you can go right down to the multifamily investing space or the house flipping space. You know, you can get really granular and go into there. If I were starting off, and or if someone in the audience is starting off, I would say do the real estate niche as a whole. So you are, in, you know, you are interviewing multifamily, you know, flippers, self storage, mobile home park folks. So that way, over time, you can gravitate towards which niche you like talking to. The most, you know, obviously you do have shows out there that are only house flippers, only multifamily investors. But I found for me, when I was starting off my show, I just wanted to interview everyone I could get my hands on. And then mm. over time, I realized I love really, I really love talking to these folks in this particular niche and then built out the show from there. Because unless you have a really large audience built at the, you know, right now, chances are most people aren't going to go back and listen to your first couple, you know, 10 or 20 episodes, especially over time, if you have a hundred 200 episodes, most likely no one's going to be listening to those first couple of episodes. So you can sort of get your foot in the door and, and sort of get a feel for it. Yeah. It, it, well, it, it's really odd though, you know, especially when it comes to real estate investing, I've actually run into a couple people that have listened to my podcast from the very beginning, like started, they found it and then started with episode one. I can't imagine listening to myself for that long. You know, I'm 370 plus episodes now. That's, that's a lot of content, but when you get some people that are diehard like that, they will stick it out. Yeah, that, that is surprising. <laughs> I know I wouldn't do that. I know I'm always like taking the, you know, the, taking the last couple of episodes of the podcast, but that that is surprising. More credit to them from starting all the way from the beginning. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you were talking about, um, you briefly touched on the fact that um, if you want broad listenership, you would niche down. That's kind of counterintuitive a lot of people would think that they should be as broad as possible to get as many listeners as as you can but you're really advising and I, I actually find that to be the case myself is that the the more niche and i think that's why we're probably starting to see more and more real estate investing pods that podcasts that focus on specific strategy yeah and i would say you know definitely one reason behind that is you can take a show and it's almost like you know let's say it has 100 listeners and you might get 20 listeners, you know, in five different real estate niches, you know, some of them I mentioned like house flipping, multifamily, self storage, mobile home park investing and say short term rentals, those are the five niches, you know, and you get 20 listeners from each and over time, 
you know, you start to bring on more guests, you know, you start to bring on some multifamily and the house flippers say, you know, I don't really want to listen to these folks. And so the short term rental. And then next thing you know, you bring on a house flipper. But those previous people that are listening to the show are no longer listening to it. And they sort of, you know, basically go away because they're no longer interested in that niche. That's not what they do in real estate. Where if you do focus specifically on that one specific niche, like, you know, short term rental, you only talk about short term rentals, you only have folks on your interview that are in short term rentals, then you can sort of be that podcast that is the number one podcast in the short term rental space. And if someone wants to learn about short term rentals, they're going to come to you, they're going to come to your podcast, and you sort of become known as that expert. It's sort of like that thing, like you don't want to be the jack of all trades, but rather a master of one. Yeah. Well, just a reminder, everybody, we're talking to Trevor Oldham, Oldham, and you can find more information with him and his team by going to podcastingu.com. There's a lot of content there, so check that website out. So let's say somebody is getting into uh, podcasting, and, uh, you know, frankly, there are a ton of podcasts out there right now. How do you stand out? Like, how do you how do you rise in the ranks? Uh, give us some strategies to uh, to be surfaced and found because I, I mean it can easily be lost in that shovel shuffle. Yeah, I would say first and foremost, you got to be consistent. There are so many people that go out there and they start a podcast and they think it's going to be you know the sort of money maker. It's going to grow their company. It's going to grow their brand, and they don't realize how much work it actually is going to be put into it. You know. So first, you got to be consistent. If you're starting a podcast, you can't just record an interview today. And then if you feel like recording another interview in two weeks, you sort of got to build that consistency with your audience. And let's say that you rec- you release an episode every Friday or every Monday, Wednesday, whatever the day may be, and you stick to it. So that's first and foremost. Second, you want to make sure that you have a built up can of episodes. When you go out there, you don't want to necessarily, you know, let's say if you have, you know, two episodes recorded, it's going to be a lot harder to stay consistent. So you typically want to have about 10 to 20, 10 to 15 interviews done uh, prior to you, you know, going out there and and starting your podcast. Um, apologies, Jack. I, I forget exactly where exactly what the question is. If you don't mind, if you don't mind. No, asking. I was just trying to find ways in which somebody could stand out from the crowd. If they're getting, if they're a new podcast, I think the last time I saw there was 3.3 million podcasts available now. And most of them are 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 dead. You know, they're they're just sitting there. But it it can be a little hard to to be noticed, if you will. Yeah, most certainly. So, I can mention being consistent is definitely one of them. Two is producing a good, highly quality show. Make sure that you're using a mic. Make sure that the guest is using a mic. Typically, most folks will have it, but sometimes you may not get one. You may have someone you know that might be I know in their car and they don't have any headset. Or, you know, there's a lot of noise going on in the background. Your audience is not going to want to hear that. And the quality is just not going to come out good. So you definitely want to make sure that's good. And if they want to make sure you have the sort of the right keywords put out there for your show when you're going out there and building your description or building your description of your show, there's numer- numerous SEO tools. If you go on Google, I'm sure you'll find something that will be able to be able to help you. You know, typically I like to use the Google Keyword Planner tool. You know, when you type in, say, type in real estate investing, you know, and that'll bring up all the different, you know, keywords that people are searching for and real estate investing. So you want to make sure that you use that. You want to make sure that you're putting out your podcast episodes out there on social media for people can find you. And then you also want to make sure, you know, I mean, I, you could always do a solo podcast, but that's a little bit trickier to grow your podcast if you're doing a solo show and you haven't built up your brand already. If you're you know, in the process of building up your brand, you can use the guests that you have that you've just interviewed with them. You know, The episode goes live. You create four to five social media posts for them. You write the captions for them. You send it to them, and they go out and promote it on their social media channels. Well, that's going to grow your podcast as well. So it's it's really a mixture of all of those. But I would say the number one thing is is definitely being consistent. You know, I just find too many podcasts. They just they just let it go. You know, it's and that has sort of had those expect- expectations too. That it is hard work. It's not something that you could start today and see a reward. You know, it, it actually might take a year or two before you really start to see any traction from it. And I think a lot of people think it is going to be an easy, easy thing to do because so many people do start podcasts. I mean, anyone can go on Amazon and buy a mic and record, you know, two or three podcast episodes and call themselves a podcast host. But it's really those folks that are in the trenches, you know, doing it for a year or two, you know, and obviously longer. Are the ones that are you know typically the most successful? Sure. 
Well, you know, you've talked about the many benefits associated with hosting a podcast, whether it's networking and and you probably can put mindset and a few other things into that bucket. But financially, what have you seen in your own experience regarding people when it comes to just marketing or raising capital or a few other things? Yeah, I would say and definitely from the standpoint of getting it's almost like being consistent, you know, in the long run, people are definitely able to, you know, become more marketable, being able to raise capital from having their own show, but they got to build their name today in that space, you know, from starting their own podcast, where again, they can't go out and start their podcast and have, you know, a month or two and expect to, you know, raise, I don't know, $10 million in capital, you know, it's going to be something that's done over time. So we find the clients that are the most successful when they do have their own podcast, you know, it is, you know, typically, it's about that year mark. Sometimes it's about that six month mark. So it is a long period of time, but it takes time to build up that audience for people to find you. But then all of a sudden, now you're six months in, you know, let's say it's someone like myself and I've listened to 15 of your episodes. Now, you know, I become no like and trust you, you know, that sort of marketing, you know, marketing thing. And all of a sudden you have a deal and you're looking for, you know, let's say the deal is 5 million, you're looking to raise a million. Uh, you're looking for, you know, 20 new accredited investors and I have the money on the side and now I've got to know, like, and trust you from hearing your podcast episodes. Then I go in and invest you and I build, you know, and that's sort of, sort of how it works. You know, in essence, it's not always that straightforward. You know, the timelines don't always match, but that's sort of what we hope to look like for a client. Sure. Well, I'm going to put you on the spot. If, if, you know, uh, when it comes to going back to hosting and stuff, what do you think of the free services and a few of those things that are out there? Yeah, I would say, you know, when it comes to the free services, it's almost like you pay for what you get. Um, at a at a point in time, I never had any luck with them. You know, as using a free service, I find that there's just issues that come up with them. You know, whether they're crashing, whether it doesn't upload properly, whether I just want to almost like pull my hair out because it's not working. It's not working too good. You know, and two, I find that with the hosting platforms, too, a lot of times they won't go back to your website if you do use a free version of it. They might do. You know, as an example, I think Anchor FM might be one of them where mm. you have your yeah, podcast. Spotify bought them not too long ago, right? Yep, yeah, exactly. So they might have, you know, your podcast name dot anchor dot FM. Well, that's not really doing anything for your your website. If someone types in, you know, let's say, you know, Jack, they type in your name and they go click over to you, the interview. You know, let's say if, hypothetically I had you on my podcast and I want to learn more about you. And now they go to get a they click on the interview I did with you. And they go to Anchor FM instead of going, you know, to my website. Where if you do use a Libsyn, you can pull the interview from Libsyn and basically embed it onto your website. So someone's actually going directly to your website instead of going to one of these free hosting platforms where that kind of dies. Where it wouldn't it be nice if someone listens to the interview that you conducted with someone and now they're on your website instead of one of these hope free hosting platforms? Then who knows what they do on their website? They check out the interview, they like it, they subscribe to your newsletter, they learn more, whatever they may be doing that would not happen on one of these sort of these sort of free platforms. And I find too, there might be a cap as well to the amount of, I guess, would, I believe it's gigabytes um, or minutes that they allow you to use. They say, you know, if you want to use us for free, you can only do an interview for 25, yeah, 25 minutes, probably not right. But would say 120 hours a month or 240 or two hour, 120 minutes or 240 minutes um, mm -hmm. per month. So it is nice not having that cap sometimes on these free platforms. Yeah. Well, a anchor is the elephant in the room really when it comes to this stuff. And, and I hate to pick on them, but there you have some valid points. And, and far as I can tell too, as soon as Spotify has purchased them, it's gotten even more restrictive. I've had, I've had some mm -hmm. people mention they can't find their RSS feed anymore. You have to email it in and request your RSS feed. I mean, that just seems silly. And then the distribution is starting to narrow. So you, of course they want you to post strictly to Spotify, you know, so it, it, it's becoming, it becomes increasingly restrictive, but anyway, um, with all of that being said, um, I would imagine that there's some KPR KPIs and measurements that you do monitor. What do you think people should keep an eye on when it comes to statistics and KPIs associated with your podcast? Yeah, I would say, you know, first and foremost is listenership. You know, you always want to check that out, you know, see if you're growing it. You know, sometimes you might hit a point where it's stagnant, but if you're starting your podcast today, it's probably going to be a low listenership. You might get five to 10 listeners per month listening to your podcast. And then in 
you know, three months you have a hundred listeners per episode and six months you have 150, you know, a year you, you might have a thousand. So that's probably, you know, probably the number one KPI or probably one of the more important KPIs, you know, that I do know that a lot of the times people look at reviews on iTunes, you know, they want to get more reviews on iTunes, you know, folks that have, you know, say, you know, 100 reviews, 75 reviews on iTunes, you know, that makes their podcast look really good. But I can tell you from notice being in the podcast industry, um, you know, even some of our clients not going to share any names, but I've seen folks that have, you know, a 1000 reviews on their podcast on iTunes, and they actually, you know, when we're doing work for them, they get 75 downloads an episode. So it can be a very misleading stat. Um, folks that see these reviews on iTunes, you know, a lot of the times when we're working with clients, you know, on the opposite side of the business where we're booking them on shows, you know, they only want to go on shows that say have, you know, X amount of number reviews on iTunes. And we always got it on iTunes. And we always have to remind them that, you know, that's not always the best metric. You, de- you know, you definitely want to go, you know, niche to, to who you're going to be speaking to. But I would say probably if you're starting your own show, you know, definitely goes back to your listenership and, and trying to build that. And that just comes over time like anything else. The more episodes you produce, the more people are going to find you. So yeah, that's that's probably the number one metric I'd say when you're starting your own show. Yeah, and, and since you brought it up, I'm going to ask my listeners if you if you are listening, finding value in this episode, can you uh, give me a quick review? That'd be that'd be great. So, well, uh, Trevor, I I have one last question when it comes to uh, guests on a podcast. You know, you mentioned earlier that you probably should write write the content and image it, provide the images so that it's easily shareable. I've done that type of thing, and I've actually been having a hard time getting my guests to share the episodes that they appear on. Is there any other strategies or tactics that I should consider trying to to get my guests to to share these out? Yeah, I would say you know obviously that's the number one you know you know number one thing. I would say two you know outside of creating that sort of let's say social media post, I find out sometimes too if they don't want to necessarily take that time to go out there and show them on social media. Sometimes you might write an email newsletter for them and you can have them try to send it out through their email list where it might be a little bit simpler, where, you know, in the, in the beginning, it might take you, you know, an hour, two hours to put together a sample newsletter for their, to give to the guests for them to produce. But then once you have it done, it's really sort of plug and play um, from there on out. So that is a, you know, a second metric as well. But I would definitely say when you're looking at the, at the guests themselves, obviously you want your branding to be a part of it, but if you can try to brand to the guests, you know, take a look at their brand colors, see what's going on with them, take a look at their Instagram, you know, would it fit sort of with their other posts that they have and take a look at that as well and try to align it uh, sort of the best that you can. And, you know, overall just do a a good quality job. Obviously, you know, it's going to be disappointing when you do all do all that work and the, and the guest still doesn't promote it, you know, you're going to get those folks um, from from time to time. But I would say can just continue to, to stick with it. Sure. Well, um, if you're ready, uh, Trevor, we'll kind of start closing things out here in a moment. I do have a few rapid fire questions and then uh, we'll wrap it up here today. But it, one last time, if you head over to podcastingu.com and learn how Trevor and his team could possibly help you start a podcast or be a better guest if you start joining podcasts. So, well, if you're ready, Trevor, I'll, I'll start uh, shooting these off to you and you can just first thing that comes to mind. Sounds perfect. So rich dad, poor dad is off the list. You're not allowed to recommend that book, but what book would you recommend everybody check out? I would definitely recommend checking out the wealthy gardener by John Seforic. It's an excellent book for those of you who haven't read. It's basically a chiropractor. I believe he's located in Pennsylvania And he built his real estate business up sort of the slow way. You know, I think he has 50 single family units built up over 20 years. And he just gives a really great story on how he was able to build his passive income stream to believe over $200,000 a year. And he didn't raise any capital. Um, He just did it all on his own, you know, through hard work and and sheer grit. So that's definitely, definitely one of those books I'd recommend. Sure. So what is the best piece of business advice you've ever received? I would say to never sell yourself short and especially comes to when it comes to pricing your business. I found that anytime we raise our prices in our business, you know, it has to be done every, every probably year or so, you know, the new folks that come in don't even hesitate to pay the new prices the, you know, cause they don't know that the prices were lower. And I found that, you know, all way back when, you know, when first starting the business, I was 
very, very little charging because I didn't believe, you know, we had a valuable service where now I could see that we have a valuable service. But a lot of the times when folks are starting their their own business, um, they're just selling themselves short and realize you definitely have a lot to offer. Sure. So what is the worst piece of business advice you've ever received? Yeah, I would say probably the worst piece of advice is that you have to be working on your business all the time. You know, I was sort of in that mindset with the previous business that I was running and probably about two years of just grinding away weekends, nights, you name it, just just burnt out and had to take almost like a, a six month, I wouldn't say leave of absence, but just couldn't look at business, couldn't run a business, couldn't even read a business book for six months just because I had pushed myself so hard and I didn't take any time to myself. So I definitely say, you know, it's nice to, you know, people working late, you know, obviously you want to build your business, but don't push yourself where you do get to that point of burnout because it's, uh, it's not that fun. Yeah. And, and your la- the last question here is probably uh, going to be a, possibly a similar answer, but if you could go back into time and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? Yeah. I would probably say again, you know, just enjoy the, enjoy the journey. You know, anytime something goes wrong in your business, you're going to be able to overcome it. There's been so many instances in the business where something has gone wrong and we've been able to figure it out. You know, a big problem that you might have, whether it's, let's say it's a deal, if it's a client, you might, you know, you lose out on a deal, you know, you lose out on a client, you're really, you know, really irritated. I understand another deal is going to come along. Another potential client's going to come along. Um, it's always going to be okay. You're always going to be able to pick yourself up and keep moving. Sure. Well, uh, Trevor, uh, I, I warned you it was coming. Was there a question or concept that you wished we would have covered here today? Yeah, I think I'm. I think we covered, you know, pretty much everything. You know, when it comes to podcasting, you know, just wanted to reiterate again: you got to be in it for the long game. You know, starting a podcast, whether you're starting a podcast, being a guest, it's going to take a long time to see results. So don't get disparaged if you have a podcast for six months or if you've been on five podcasts and aren't seeing results. It's going to be something that is a long game. Yeah. Well, uh, one more time, podcastingyou.com. I'll make sure to have that link in the show notes, but really appreciate your time here today, Trevor. Perfect. Thank you, Jack.